Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the end of chapter two, uh, the last few pages, um, pages 29 and 30 um, in the Penguin edition. Um, and in the same way that we saw at the end of chapter one, um, Orwell moving from description to commentary, um, from looking at the lives of the people towards offering some form of commentary, he does the same thing at the end of chapter two. In the previous screencast, we looked at um, the conditions of the mine workers. We looked at how hot and how stuffy and how difficult it was for them to actually get the stuff, the coal out of the mine in the first place. Um, the rest of the chapter um, goes into more detail on that. And for me, it's the most powerful and, and detailed um, chapter in the book. And also for me, one of the, the, the best pieces of journalistic writing uh, ever, certainly in the 20th century. There is some extraordinary description in chapter two and I do encourage you to, to read and reread it because it does it does repay close reading. However, just for the sake of um, these screencasts, I want to just look at the, the last couple of pages in this chapter. Because what Orwell does is he, he takes the um, description and he takes the, the, the detail and then he draws it all together uh, into a comment. And what he essentially does is what he does in a very similar way to um, the end of chapter one with the Brookers as he takes the, um, the, 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 the raw details and he comments on how the miners are very much the roots, the backbone of our progress and success as a society. So let's have a look at the, um, the chapter. Actually, before we do that, before we look at the, um, the chapter itself, I want you to consider a couple of questions. Um, because they underpin what Orwell talks about. I want you to just think, just just um, think of the, these three questions. And in a moment, I just want you to pause this video, this screencast, and I actually want you to really, you know, think about it. If you're looking through this with someone else, talk, talk with them. And if not, just make one or two notes. So these questions are, and these refer to you personally, not the miners, and not all well. What would happen if we woke up tomorrow when there was no electricity? And I don't just mean a power cut, I mean there was no electricity. There was no way of getting it uh, and it's essentially it was no longer a commodity, no longer something that we had. What would be the immediate effects? What would happen within minutes, hours of, of, of losing it? And then what would be the longer term effects and how long do you think we'd last without it? And I want you to think just beyond the fact that oh, you couldn't charge your iPad or we wouldn't be able to turn on a light and think about the, the what actually how much of our society is underpinned by electricity. So if you just um, spend a few moments, just two or three minutes, um, pause the video uh, and then we'll continue and have a think about it. OK, so you've probably had a time to think about um, the kind of, I suppose, what would happen within your immediate vicinity. Things like the fact that you would have no access to technology, wireless would disappear. Um, even if your iPad had a battery charge, it would be fairly useless because you would be able to connect. You'd have no ability to um, to use a telephone, to text, um, to communicate outside, speaking to the p person beside you. Um, it wouldn't be long before um, things like uh, b petrol stations would stop working because they're obviously it's petrol, but they're powered by electricity. Um, that uh, the shops, freezers, food would start rotting. Uh, the delivery network would break down, so it wouldn't be long before you wouldn't even have food. Longer term effect, obviously, it would be utter chaos. I, I really don't think it would be more than a few days before um, anarchy, anarchy broke out and the law just completely broke down. So just bear that in mind when we look at this chapter, at the end of this chapter, because Orwell really is saying something quite similar about coal. OK, so there's this first... Um, part and, and it begins watching coal miners at work, which is page 26. So watching coal miners at work, you realise momentarily what different universes people inhabit. Um, I think here he's, he really is talking about the universes between um, us, between the middle classes, the educated classes and the miners. OK, that's the, those are the different universes. He's not talking about different worlds. It's the universe is quite interesting because that suggests something which is so utterly different. It's not just a different world, it's a different universe. 
down there where the coal is dug is a sort of world apart, which one can easily go through life without ever hearing about. Um, and the one there, again, is the middle classes. Probably the majority of people would even prefer not to hear about it. Well, why? Why would the majority of people prefer not to hear about it? It's fairly obvious. You don't want to know about people sweating their guts out just so you can have a nice, easy life, do you? You don't, you, you don't want to hear about that. So he's challenging this. I think here is a challenge. I think in this book, what Orwell does is he challenges us as, the, as a middle class reader. And remember, the vast majority of people reading this book would have been the middle classes. They were the people with the education. They were the people with the interest in reading uh, the writers like Orwell. And so he is challenging his readers to think about and to hear about and to smell and to, to, to see for themselves the conditions that these miners work in. Well, then he goes on. It's an absolutely necessary counterpart to our world above. That word their counterpart, suggesting it's like a companion. You know, if you talk about a counterpart, you talk about a companion or a friend or a colleague, something, someone that you work alongside. So he seems here to be contrasting the different universes with the fact that actually they have to work hand in hand. You can't have, we can't have our world, the world above, without the counterpart, the companion, the friend or the colleague of the miners. So if you like what he's doing, he's, he's drawing us back together. He's drawing the miners and the middle classes together. One cannot, well, I mean, I suppose you could say that probably the, the, the if, if we come, come down here in a moment, we'll talk about the, diff, the types of people that Orwell's talking about. The vast majority of the people below here, the miners could well do without, but none of the people below here could do without the miners. So practically everything we do from eating an ice to crossing the Atlantic, baking a loaf to writing a novel involves the use of coal. So he talks about various um, activities, novel writing, he's talking about art, and down here he talks about poetry, that the arts are dependent on coal. There is a link, there is a direct link between writing a poem and the miners mining. Without it, the poets can't scratch the, one another's backs. That Hitler can't march the goose step, the Pope can't denounce Bol Bolshevism. All of these things need coal. Whatever might be happening on the surface, the hacking and shoveling have got to continue without a pause. So there's this consistent need, this this continual need for coal in order that the world can keep turning without it the, the world just will will literally stop in the same way that we i spoke a moment ago about electricity we're talking about a similar thing here in the 1930s obviously there was electricity but in many in many t houses they they still wouldn't have had electricity in a lot of these houses they wouldn't they would have had gas lamps for lights um, and they would have had um, coal uh, to heat the houses. So the reason I wanted you to initially to think about this, about electricity, was because um, for us, electricity, or for, for these people, coal was as important as electricity. But then he takes it a stage further, as Orwell always does. You may have noticed this by now. Orwell gets going on something, uh, and then he just keeps going and keeps going, and he, he builds momentum all of his own, which is why I think he's such a brilliant, brilliant writer. On the whole, we're not aware of it. Again, he's continually referring to the collective pronoun, okay? He's talking about we. Not you, not I. In this case, he's we. He's drawing the middle classes together. That we are all the same. However much we might like to think we're not, we are all the same. We are the ones that must have coal. He says here, we seldom or never remember what coal getting involves. And then he brings himself in. Here am I, sitting writing in front of my comfortable cold fire. It is April. So there's these direct, specific details that he refers to. I think this is very, very clever. He's taking it from the broad. Remember, he does this quite often. He goes from the, from the, from the specific to the general. And then he often goes back into the specific. He'll make broad comments, Orwell, 
uh, or sorry, he'll begin a chapter talking about specifics like he did with the Brooker's house and like he did with the coal mine. And then he broadens out into much broader comments. And now what he's doing is he's drawing it back into the particular. It's very, very good writing, very clever writing. And he talks about the coal car drives up to the door, men in leather jerkins carry the coal indoors. Look at the attention to detail. Really just so, so he hones in on those tiny details. That's the novelist there. That's all well the novelist coming through as opposed to Orwell, the um, social commentator. We get that real sort of, we get that sort of melding, that mixing of journalism and nov a journalist and novelist here. Really good quality, solid writing. There's not a word here out of place uh, and he's bringing us back into a detail. He realizes he needs to bring us back into a detail. So we, like him, do the same thing we sit in front of our comfortable coal fire and we don't give a thought about where this coal comes from and it says he says it's only very rarely when i make a definite mental effort that i connect this coal with the far off labor in the mind i think the eye there is referring to again all of us he's talking about himself but of course actually he's talking about he's talking about us it's only when we make a de definite mental effort that we connect the fact where we're looking at this screencast on an iPad or a laptop or an iPod touch or an iPhone or whatever. It's only when we make this definite mental effort that we track the action of look watching something back to um, the, the, the fact that we have um, the ability to do it through, through um, ele having electricity in the first place. And then this bot, he, he takes it down here all the way, he goes, down into the earth the black stuff arises mysteriously from nowhere in particular like manner except you have to pay for it you could quite easily drive a car right across the north of england and never once remember that hundreds of feet below the road you're the, the miners are hacking at the coal and i think this is where that this is the bottom line here it's the fact that they're invisible that you forget them you know the the, the coal mines themselves you can't see because they're underground a nuclear power station you can see, a coal fire generator you can see, but the actual coal itself and the action of extracting coal you can't see because it's below ground. And so it's a, it's a real sense here of out of sight, out of mind. And then he links this, this, this really clever sentence here. Yet in a sense it is the miners who are driving your, your car forward. So there's the, that direct link again that we've talked about before direct link between the miners and the car and then there's this wonderful um, this wonderful metaphor that he uses here oh, I suppose it's as similar as the route is to the fire it's 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 um, figurative it's figurative language that he's using again that's the, the, the novelist coming back here the lamplit world is as necessary to the daylight world above us the route is to the flower that the miners are our roots without them we would perish yeah, without electricity, we in the 21st century would simply perish. And it's the same thing here with the miners. And then he just come, he comes, he, he, then he gets, again, he goes even further, as Orwell does, as I've just said. He takes it even further now. Um, he, he talks about how not long ago, women, pregnant women, this is a pretty severe image, Pregnant women would be crawling on all fours, dragging tubs of coal. I mean, that's an extraordinarily brutal, brutal image. This is 90s, talking about the 19th century here. Um, by the tw by the, towards the middle of the 20th century, the 1930s and 40s, the conditions in the coal mines had improved. I mean, in the 19th century, the conditions were just beyond awful. I mean, if you think it seems what Orwell's talking about here seems bad. I mean, in the 19th century, there were no workers' rights whatsoever, and pregnant women would be down there crawling on all fours like dogs, dragging tubs of coal. But this is really interesting, look, and even now, if, if coal could not be produced without pregnant women dragging it to and fro, I fancy we should let them do it rather than deprive ourselves of coal. Now, that is such a challenge, isn't it? That is such a challenge to the middle-class reader. And that's a challenge to us as well. You know, what, 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 would, we, what would we put up with? What would we al allow other people to put up with so that we kept the things that we wanted to keep? This is what I was talking to you about the other day with Foxconn and, and, and Apple. 
and you know we love our apple products you know i've got them you've got them they're great they work brilliantly they they're fun to use so on and so forth but if it meant in order for us to keep on affording these products that conditions in in these countries where they're produced became worse and worse to the point where pregnant women were on all fours dragging things would would we would we and allow that to happen in order so that we we main kept these products and it's the same thing he's saying here would would the 1930s middle classes deprive themselves of coal in order that this doesn't happen it's such a such a challenge um to the reader and and to a middle class reader this would have been quite shocking and he, he then takes it then he broadens it out here it's the same with all types of manual work not just coal mining any type of manual work um, is underpinning our existence. It keeps us alive and we are oblivious of its existence. More than anything, perhaps the miner can stand as a type can stand as the type of the manual worker. Remember we talked in the last screencast as as the um the um the miner being the kind of the icon and, and, and the way in which he refers to the miner, the way in which he describes the miner as having these sort of muscles, these chiseled muscles and sinewy thighs and the bronze statue almost that he's erecting um, this this miner to be. And, and here again, it links into that idea of the miner of being a type of manual worker. In fact, he's so vitally necessary, like the blood in our veins, that we would forget, we forget about blood. We forget that it even exists. Um, and yet without it, we would be dead. It's like electricity. It's like the wireless. You know exactly what I'm talking about here. You know when you go into school and you turn on your iPad and the wireless doesn't work. And it's suddenly that, oh, here we go again. But when it's working, we forget about it. We turn on the device. It's like maybe when you're at home or in an internet cafe or somewhere where it actually is reliable. Um, you turn it on and it works and you don't even think about it. And it's the same here. All of these things link together without... Um, Without having um, electricity, we would soon realise just how difficult our world would be. And then there's this fine, final, final challenge, I suppose. This final challenge that um, Orwell is 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 posing us. He's taking this argument in many ways uh, a stage further, and that we can only be the people that we are, not just surviving, not just surviving generally, but be the people that we are with these miners. It is only because miners sweat their guts out that superior persons can remain superior. And that I think he's using that word in a deeply ironic way. He's not calling himself superior at all. In many ways, I think he sees the miners as superior. He doesn't put them in um, inverted commas like you might think he, he does, because I think he's, he's much too subtle for that. You and I and the editor of the Times, Lit's Literary Supplement, the poets, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Comrade X, author of Marxism for Infants, that's deeply ironic. He's really having a dig at the middle class Mar Marxist here. You know, he's really kind of, he's really sticking the knife into these what he, who he perceives to be these ridiculous people writing these, I mean, this is a made-up book, um, thinking that it's important to write a book um, on Marxism for infants. All of these people can be the intellectual superiors because of the black and the, 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 the poor drudges underground. So, so not only um, can, are, are we surviving, but we're unable to be intellectual, we're able to grow as intellectuals and develop um, with with coal, or in our case with electricity, that you know we, we wouldn't be able to learn in the way that we learn. We wouldn't be able to develop as a society without um, without the, the stuff, that, that the, the blood, I suppose, that, that courses through our veins. So that'll, that's, that's it for this passage. There's an awful lot to go on. Um, I do sort of suggest that you do read it and reread it because it's one of those passages that could well come up uh, in the IOC um, because it's one of those passages that not only is very rich in terms of its sty stylistic um, techniques and in, in the way in which Orwell writes, but the message is just so unbelievably deep and powerful.